Welcome to Who's in STEM. I'm Ken Ono, your host and the STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum Professor of Mathematics at UVA. On Who's in STEM, our goal is to evoke flights of imagination and wonder by showcasing the cornucopia of all that is STEM at UVA, the marvelous world of UVA science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. In this episode, we celebrate Earth Day. Earth Day 2023, April 22nd. I grew up in the 70s and 80s in Towson, a suburb of Baltimore in Maryland, and I was a rabid fan of the Baltimore Orioles baseball team. If they're like my age or older, some listeners might remember slugger Steady Eddie Murray. Or they might remember the legendary fan Wild Bill Hagee with his Grizzly Adams beard and cowboy hat leading the cheers from Section 34 of Memorial Stadium. I have fond childhood memories of steamy summer nights on the patio listening to the games on our staticky AM radio, the one we got from Radio Shack. We had bushels of steamed blue crabs coated in Old Bay seasoning piled high on our picnic table, the one that was covered in newspaper. Clad in cut-off jeans, T-shirts, and disposable plastic bibs, we pried open the crustaceans by hand, we clobbered them with wooden crab mallets, and we cracked their claws with nutcrackers. The goal of this messy operation was simple, to make small piles of the prized sweet crab meat that we later devoured with six packs of RC Cola. Now these crabs, they're a local delicacy. The crabs were harvested from the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary in North America, an abundant resource for those of us lucky enough to call DC or Maryland or Virginia home. I bring this up because three months ago in January, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation released the 2022 State of the Bay Report. It was a report card. The point of this report card was to grade the health of the bay. The grade? A horrid D+. Among the contributing factors, the blue crab population, now at historic lows. Does that sound familiar? It's just like the all-too-common news stories that we hear about the bleached and dying coral reefs in the oceans around the world. Our guest today is on the front lines of this battle. She's studying the resilience of water ecosystems, and she's leading restoration efforts to benefit future generations. Professor Karen McGlathery is the director of the Environmental Resilience Institute and the head of the Ecological Research Project on the Virginia Coast Reserve. And she's here to tell us about her work and, quite appropriately, to help us celebrate a hopeful Earth Day. But first, let's celebrate who's making discoveries. I've got two stories to share today. I love this first one. UVA undergrad Zach Boner and Louisa Edwards have developed an app that combats sepsis. That's infection of the blood, the leading cause of death in hospitals. Their app, which is based on artificial intelligence tools, determines the likelihood of sepsis using real-time monitoring of various markers. Now, I loved learning this. Why? Because Zach actually was a student in my fall graduate-level course in number theory, a topic that is far from his primary interest in medical technology. You heard that right, my graduate course in number theory. How lucky we are at UVA to have the privilege to teach students like Zach and Louisa. They make us all quite proud. The second item also is quite close to my heart in that it involves numbers, and I'm a mathematician. UVA School of Data Science, led by Dean Phil Bourne, has formed a partnership with Flinders University in Australia. What's the point of this partnership? It's to expand research and knowledge exchange in areas that are really quite meaningful to all of us areas such as artificial intelligence, data security, and their implications for democracy. Their goal is quite simple and important. It speaks to all of us today. The goal is to combat misinformation and disinformation through the development of new technology. This is, indeed, a splendid example of President Ryan's motto, for us to be great and good in all that we do as these tools will help strengthen and restore faith in democracies. And that's Who's Making Discoveries. Today, 
we're talking about environmental research. Our guest, Professor McGlattery, conducts research that explores how climate change affects coastal ecosystems, specifically here in Virginia. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Professor McGlattery. Karen, if I may. Thanks so much for having me, Ken. So I'd like to circle back to the little story I told from my childhood. The plight of the Chesapeake's crabs, they remind me of the history of the sardines of the Monterey Bay. In the 1930s, sardines were abundant and the fishing industry was booming, famously immortalized in John Steinbeck's classic American novel, Cannery Row. But within 10 years and in actual real life, the sardines disappeared. They vanished overnight in terms of biological timescales. And as a result, the local economy collapsed. So we should be aware. We should be afraid. We should be worried because we have to care for these water ecosystems. So Karen, as the local expert, I turn to you because as I understand it, such a collapse has already happened here in Virginia with coastal seagrass. Tell us about that. That's right, Ken. Uh, Seagrass once carpeted the seafloor in the shallow lagoons off the eastern shore of Virginia. Imagine a tall prairie just underwater. So instead of the wind causing the leaves to sway, it's the flow of the water. So at the turn of the last century, these seagrass meadows supported the country's largest scallop fishery. Mm. And they were also extremely important in the Chesapeake Bay, as you noted. Then in the 1930s, a pandemic disease swept the world's ocean and caused a global die-off of this seagrass. In Virginia, the final blow was a hurricane in 1933, what was referred to as the Great Storm, because that was back before they named hurricanes. And that caused seagrass to go completely extinct. And it stayed that way until the late 1990s when a local waterman found a small patch of seagrass. And that spurred a large-scale restoration of the area. The loss of the seagrass had a huge impact on the local economy that was really dependent on the scallop fishery. And so between 1930 and 1933, the scallop fishery went from about 2,000 pounds a year to zero. And when the scallop fishery crashed, so did the economy. A side note, interestingly, this great storm of 1933 also caused all the people who lived on the barrier islands to pick up their homes and their church and their schools and float them on rafts across the lagoons and resettle on the mainland. So we often hear about climate migration now, and this is an example of it happening over a century ago. Mm. So the church that used to be out on Hog Island, the Barry Island, is now in the village of Oyster, where UVA's Coastal Research Center is, where my research is based. Hmm. Climate is always changing, right? And I hope we can learn from these lessons. So, Karen, much of your work actually focuses on this seagrass. I'd like you to add some detail to why we study this plant. Well, seagrass meadows aren't as iconic as, say, tropical rainforests or coral reefs, but they are certainly just as important. One of the most important values of seagrass and other coastal wetlands like mangroves and salt marshes is that they're very productive and they use One of the basic processes of life, which is photosynthesis, they take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, they make plant biomass, some of that gets buried in the soil, and that carbon can be locked up for decades to centuries. And we call this blue carbon, and it's this kind of carbon sequestration as one of nature's ways of combating climate change, of mitigating climate change by taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So we think a lot about carbon sequestration in seagrass meadows, but they're also extremely important and we benefit in many other ways. They're critical habitats for fisheries like blue crabs and scallops. Many fish use seagrass meadows when they're young and when they get big enough that they're not going to get eaten by as much by a predator and they move off coast. So they It's use, like a local sargassum. That's right. right. <laughs> they're used as a nursery habitat. And they also improve water quality and protect shorelines from storm waves. So there are many, many ways that seagrass meadows are important to people. Oh, thanks for explaining all of that. And this actually leads into your work. You're well known as a champion for seagrass restoration. You've revived large tracts of what was formerly barren seabed in what's called the Virginia Coast Reserve Project. So tell us, what have you achieved? How do you do it? Well, I'll first start by saying we often hear negative stories about environmental change and climate change, and that can be really hard to take time after time again. The story of the seagrass restoration is an incredibly positive one, and it's a reason to be optimistic. 
In the Virginia coast, we have what is now referred to as the world's largest seagrass restoration, uh, and it has really put Virginia on the map. It's a collaboration between William and Mary and the Nature Conservancy and UVA. They have done the actual seeding, and we're leading the science behind the recovery. So we've been working on this for about two decades now. A big part of what we do in my lab group is we do an annual summer sampling. We go with about 20 undergraduates, graduate students, faculty, and staff out into the meadows and measure everything there is to measure. It's a team effort, and it's really a lot of fun. We go out on small boats. We don our wetsuits and our masks and snorkels, and we jump in the water. We work for about four hours, two hours before for low tide and two (laughs) hours after low tide because we need to be able to get up and walk to the boat when we're done. Some people count seagrass. Other people take soil samples. You count the seagrass? You actually— Individual blades of— You do. Oh, my God. You lie on— I'm a numbers person, but that's— (laughs) Seafloor and you count. You hold them like a ponytail and you keep counting. I vowed when I was an undergrad I'd never do that, and this is what I do now. But it's important. (laughs) What happens if you lose track? You start over again. (laughs) And you can't talk to anybody. (laughs) You know, if you're lucky when you're lying there, you know, fish will come up and kind of poke at your mask, wondering what you're doing. If you're lucky, you might even see a seahorse. So that's pretty exciting. So I guess I would just reflect and say I've been at this for about 20 years. When I came to UVA, there were no seagrass in the lagoons. Now it's just I feel awe when I go out there. I look out on the horizon. All I can see is these vast seagrass meadows. Yeah, so if we were to measure in acres, barren, zero up to how many thousands of acres? 9,000. 9,000. So, and I'm a soccer fan. That's about 5,000 soccer fields. Wow. And we only seeded about 500. So that difference between 500 and 9,000 is nature doing its job. So we just nudged nature along. So have the scallop populations rebounded? There are people who are seeding the seagrass meadows with scallops. Mm -hmm. So we do see scallops. Mm. We can go out. I can find a scallop that's the size of my palm now. Oh, that's great. And when you first started, it was just nothing. sand, earth. That's fantastic. So, Karen, I want to shift gears here. A few episodes ago, Howie Epstein, the chair of the Environmental Sciences Department, was on our show, and he talked about with Lauren Simpkins, the work they do on the polar ice caps. And one thing he mentioned to me about you, I really want to circle back to. He said that much of your work focuses on human interaction. And what you've described to me, actually, some of it seems quite lonely, you know, floating in, you know, in the ocean counting seagrass. So exactly what does he mean when he says that you're a strong supporter of human interaction in your work? Well, part of it is through my role as director of the Environmental Resilience Institute. So I'm a huge believer in the power of interdisciplinary collaboration. So we have teams from all across grounds working together to try to find solutions to climate issues that are facing us. On a personal level, I guess one example I might give is the work that I'm doing on something we call the Coastal Futures Conservatory with music professor Matthew Bertner and environmental ethicist and religious studies professor Wills Jenkins. And essentially what we're doing is we're listening to the science. So we're putting microphones, for example, out in an oyster reef, and we're listening to the sound that the oyster reef makes. It tells us something about the health of the oyster reef, how it functions. Instead of a violin or cello or piano, we're hearing fish and oysters and snapping shrimp as our instruments. Mm. So we can really understand about how it's functioning. To be honest, I was a little skeptical the first time we did it. I thought I knew what it would sound like, and I didn't at all. It was much more complex than I thought. So when you go scuba diving, do you now have a completely different appreciation (laughs) for the sounds? Well, often when you're scuba diving, if you're really scuba diving, you're just hearing your bubbles, bubbles, Bubbles. your breathing. Um, So this is actually much more interesting. Uh The other thing that we do is we sonify data. So we take our long-term data, like temperature data, And we listen to the patterns and the cadence of those data, those numbers. And we share this with the public. We give presentations at scientific meetings. And we think that listening really heightens people's awareness, their empathy, their connection with climate change more than if we were just simply to show a graph. Right. So are there temporal studies where you can evaluate the health 
of these sea grasslands over time, you can measure that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, part of what is the foundation of this ecological research project is long-term data. We have, in some cases, 30 years of data on the seagrass meadows, how they breathe, they take in CO2 and release oxygen. And Matthew has made a musical composition about this. Oh, so would you describe it as the ocean singing to you when it's happy? Well, to be honest, the first time he played it for me, I I was stressed out because it was so noisy. It didn't sound like music. And I thought, this is not going to appeal to people. So we worked back and forth so that he made more of a aesthetically pleasing composition that really, you know, showed what the patterning of the data was and how it was changing over the long term, but in a way that was maybe a little more pleasing. Is there a particular piece that you could share with us? Sure. Well, Matthew has sonified the breathing of the restored seagrass meadows over time. So you can hear the taking up carbon dioxide, releasing oxygen, and he uses those data. Wonderful. And for our listeners, here it is. So, Karen, in addition to the sonification of data, in terms of musicality, are there some pieces that you could share with us for comparison? Yes, Matthew sonified the carbon and nitrogen cycling in seagrass meadows, and this is something that we share with the public. And here it is. That's all fascinating. I'm so glad that we're talking about all of this for our Earth Day special. And speaking about Earth Day, let's be honest, we're a long way from reaching our climate change goals. And as an expert, I have to ask, what can we do to bridge the gap? Well, universities have a really important role and responsibility to take our research and discoveries on climate change and translate them in ways that can be used by the public. One example I could give you is work that we've done on climate equity, again, on the eastern shore of Virginia. So this is building on those 30 years of research on the coastal ecosystems and thinking about how climate change, sea level rise and storm flooding impacts people in disproportionate ways on the eastern shore and what we can do to make climate action more equitable. So we're really focused on what we can do as scientists and researchers to help communities on the Eastern Shore make informed decisions. And what really makes it work is that we have engineers and social research scientists and environmental scientists, but we have community leaders. We have two people. One is a faith leader, and the other is the head of the youth programs of the YMCA. They're our partners in this. They're on our leadership team. They're helping us get community members to our meetings talking to them, helping us define what is really important. What do they care about? What are the needs? How can our science serve that? So for me, it's really exciting because I've been working there for so long, but I've mostly been hanging out in the ecosystems. And now we're really connecting very directly with people, and they're helping us figure out what the best path is forward. That's awesome. When I said earlier that you're on the front lines, there you have it. For all the listeners, that is proof. That's what it looks like when STEM researchers put their expertise to good use to help make the world a better place. So, Karen, if you could make just one request of our policymakers in Richmond and D.C., what would that be? Well, that's an easy one. My request would be that Virginia stays in REGI, which is the Regional Greenhouse Initiative. So this is a consortium of 12 states in the Mid-Atlantic and New England, and it's a regional-based program that sets limits on carbon pollution and attaches a price to that that's paid by power companies and then reinvests that money into Virginia's communities that are impacted by climate change. So it's a really important path forward to more stable climate, to healthy, clean energy, to reducing carbon emissions at the state level. That's really important. Science doesn't help if the scientists and the policymakers don't communicate and are aware of each other's primary challenges. So turning to UVA, we're all part of UVA, and I'm surprised to learn that you've been a who for 27 years. 
You've spent your entire career here on grounds at UVA or part of the UVA research station on the shore. As an advisor of students, as an administrator, as you said, you're a director, a researcher, and a professor. So with all of that experience, our listeners really want you to reflect on your time here at UVA. Can you share a fond memory or two? It's a hard question to ask for a fond memory or two over 27 years. There are many, many that involve many incredible colleagues and students that I've worked with over the years. I would say that my fondest memories are based on the Eastern Shore, where my research career is focused. If I reflect on those years, the ones that I think stick out the most are the ones that, again, involve the connection between researchers and the community. So one is recent. that We had a workshop as part of our climate equity project that was organized by the Equity Center and the Institute for Engagement and Negotiation at UVA. We had about 80 community members come to this workshop. They talked to us about their concerns about climate change. They put sticky notes on maps to show where they'd experienced flooding when they couldn't get to work or their school buses couldn't pick up their kids. They created a timeline of generations of change on the coast. All of that, again, is sort of connecting the value of our work with people that need it. The other one is also on the coast. It was one about 15 years ago when we built the Coastal Research Center. It was a big deal. Before that, we were in a small farmhouse that was falling down around us, and the living room was our lab. And so we built this research station, and we had an opening. And President Castine was there, and the director of NSF who gave us funding was there, and the whole village of Oyster, where our lab is, was there. And circling back to what you said in the beginning, after the presentations, we were out on the dock eating blue crabs Mm. and, you know, putting a punctuation point on the end of a really great event. And it was really a turning point for the research that we're doing on the coast. I remember one story that the program manager at NSF told me that one of my twin daughters, who was six at the time, walked up to him, took his hand and said, you know, my mom knows something about the ocean. (laughs) (laughs) And he said, well, that's a good thing. So, Karen, what advice can you offer students who are really excited by the work that you and others in environmental sciences here at UVA, the work that you do, what advice would you give them? How can they become involved? Well, there are many ways to get involved in environmental research. We have in our department, environmental science department, we have a mentoring program that pulls together teams of undergraduate, graduate students, and faculty members to work on research projects during the academic year for credit. We have summer internships at our Coastal Research Center, and there are also internships at two other field stations of UVA, so Blandy Farm and Mountain Lake. And at the Environmental Resilience Institute, we have many paid internships, both during January term and in the summer. And these are really interesting because they pull together student faculty teams with practitioners out in the real world. So it could be a nonprofit, it could be a government agency, it could be an industry partner, could be anything. And so people interested in connecting with us and the research that we do could connect in that way. And they can find information about this through the department website, the Department of Environmental Sciences at UVA. And also the Environmental Resilience Institute website. So wrapping up, as I mentioned a few times now, this episode is meant to celebrate a hopeful Earth Day. So Karen, how are you going to celebrate Earth Day? I think I'd tell you how I'm going to celebrate Earth Week. Earth Week. So the first thing I'm doing is giving an invited talk at NSF, the National Science Foundation, about our climate equity project. They're really interested. It's part of their Earth Week celebration. They're really interested in the work that we're doing and how they can do more of that kind of work. Then I'm talking to undergraduates about climate equity and justice as part of UVA's new residential initiative. So... Earth Day is on a Saturday. I'll probably be at home relaxing with my family and dog and working in my garden. Lovely. Well, thank you, Karen. You're a shining example of President Ryan's vision for UVA to be great and good in all that we do. Thank you for your dedication to UVA. And thank you on behalf of every person in the Commonwealth. Thank you for your strong environmental advocacy and the many things that you do to support and promote climate equity. I'm Ken Ono, STEM advisor to the provost and the Marvin Rosenblum professor of mathematics, and you've been listening to Who's in STEM. Who's in STEM is a production of WTJU 91.1 FM 
and the Office of the Provost at the University of Virginia. Who's in STEM is produced by Catherine Kostaboom, Rhea Verma, Mary Garner McGee, and Arian Ballou. Our music is composed and performed by Robert Schneider and John Ferguson of Apples in Stereo. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where we will be giving out t-shirts this week. Listen and subscribe to Who's in STEM on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'll be back soon with another conversation about scientific and technological innovation at the university.